Good evening. Welcome to the Billy Wilder Theater. This is the home of public programs for UCLA Film and Television Archive. My name is KJ Relf. I'm a film programmer with the Archive, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's double feature of The Brother from Another Planet and Baby It's You, both directed by our guest tonight, Mr. John Sales. <laughs> The Film and Television Archive would like to acknowledge our presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongvar peoples. We're humbled to do work in this community. So the first film tonight, The Brother from Another Planet, was preserved to 35 millimeter by former UCLA archivist, Mr. Ross Lippman. Um, he also preserved, if you were here on Thursday, the two other features that we watched that night, uh, John's first two features. Um, and we're also screening a 16 millimeter print of Baby It's You. Both come from the archives collection, uh, which is the home to sales and uh, partner Maggie Renzi's anarchist convention moving image archive. So tonight's screening is part of five nights in Los Angeles for Mr. Sales, uh, which will conclude uh, continue tomorrow uh, with a double feature of Lone Star and Limbo, and that's over at the Arrow Theater in Santa Monica. That starts at four o'clock, um, a little bit of an earlier showtime for the to accommodate the longer runtime of both of those films. And um, Francis McDormand will be there, joining John for the Q and A. That's a really special, exciting opportunity. I haven't seen Lone Star in, a, in such a long time, and I'm so excited to see it on the big screen um, for me for the first time on the big screen. Um, and then. Uh, the long weekend that we've planned here will conclude on Monday, which is a holiday. Um, we'll watch the new digital restoration of Maidwan, followed by City of Hope. Um, and so after the first feature tonight, please, uh, I encourage you all to stick around for a QA. and a um, We will be asking John to come on stage and uh, for a conversation with screenwriter Josh Olson. And they'll be joined about halfway through by Vincent Spano, the star of Baby It's You. Um, and he can talk about his time working on that film. Um, but first, before we uh, kick off with Brother from Another Planet, I want to invite up to the Wilder stage to say a few words. The inevitable, John Sales. Uh, hi, so thanks for coming. Uh, Brother from Another Planet um, was a, a movie that... Um, I, it's the only movie that I ever made that came from dreams. Um, I had been, um, we, we were trying to make Mate One and the money was getting very iffy and then it fell apart and I had just before the money fell apart, the day before we were going to fly down to West Virginia and start to make it, um, I had been uh, in the mixing room and mixing is a very expensive process for a low budget filmmaker you know it's like it feels like it's about a thousand dollars a minute and um, I was having these these kind of pressure dreams about movies and the first one was that I, I was writing a movie for Joe Dante that was called assholes from outer space <laughs> and uh, there wasn't much of a story to it but it, it you know it had that old 50s title with a assholes you know with a kind of 3d title coming at you and then it was about um very humanoid looking people except they had the little antenna and they had landed and they they were working at places like the motor vehicle department and they were assholes and um and but they you know it just didn't it seemed more like a saturday night live skit than than a movie um, a night later, I had a dream that I was uh, directing a movie in black and white uh, called Bigfoot in the City um, that was about a Sasquatch that was loose in Seattle, so there were a lot of you know, wet down cobblestone streets and everything, and, and all I remember was I, I dreamed the last scene in it where the wound, it was it kind of obviously based on um, uh, Odd Man Out, the James Mason, uh, Carol Reed movie. And um, this wounded Sasquatch was lying on these cobblestones in an alley, and there was a Jack Webb-looking, you know, detective standing over him saying, "Book him." Um, and I woke up and I said, "That is more like a Saturday Night Live skit than a, than a movie." And then finally, the third night, I had a dream, and it was an African American guy walking down 125th Street. 
and the way that you you realize things in a in in a dream without having them dramatized uh i said god that's the most alienated guy he's so alone there's all this action because 125 5th street is pretty lively and he's so alone and why is he and then i realized he's alone he's alienated because he's an alien and uh i i was sitting with uh maggie renzi and and uh peggy reisky who were going to produce uh make one and commiserating over the fact that the money had just fallen apart and I said, well, I have this idea, um, and, and it's about, don't ask me too much, but it's about an alien who crash lands in, in the harbor and, and ends up kind of assimilating up in, in Harlem. And um, I think we can make it for very little money in about four weeks. And they said, well, you hate to shoot in the winter. I said, no, 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 you, you start producing and I'll start writing. And... Um, I, I started writing, I wrote a, a, a draft in about a week and a half, and I had been writing for people, I was, I was adapting Clan of the Cave Bear into a movie, and they, they and back in those days, they actually flew writers out to the West Coast, instead of just waiting until they showed up, um, which is my career now. Um, and they, uh, I, they flew me first class, which I think they were supposed to do back in those days, and when I checked in, uh, the stewardess uh, said, well, you won the lottery. And I, I was in seat number you know, 1B. And I got on the plane. And what she meant was I was sitting next to Paul Newman. <laughs> and, uh, and the poor stu stewardess in the little jump seat who was facing him like this far away, her knees were shaking the whole takeoff. And so I'm, I'm writing away, and I'm writing away. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do my second draft of Brother from Another Planet. And some guy who worked for, there was a company then called Playboy Productions, who I apparently had a meeting with one time. So, oh, here's my chance to meet Paul Newman. There's the screenwriter with, you know. And so he comes over and says, hey, you're trying to write a screenplay in one, you know, flight to L.A. And I go, well, that's the idea. And, and, and I didn't introduce him to Paul Newman because I didn't know Paul Newman. So he walked away thinking I was a real jerk. And Paul Newman's turned to me and said, I'm so relieved. I, I saw you writing brother, 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 and I thought you were a religious fanatic. <laughs> and I was going to have to hear about it the second half of the flight. So, <laughs> so this is a movie that um, I wrote very quickly. Uh, we got the crew together very quickly. We shot it very quickly. And uh, we shot it up in Harlem and just had a great time. Um, every day was just... Uh, a scrum, and but we were getting good stuff with really good actors. Uh, uh, Joe Morton had been in one movie before. Uh, he, he was mostly a kind of Shakespearean theater actor with this wonderful voice, and I cast him as a character who doesn't speak. Um, uh, if you're making a low-budget movie, having your lead be mute so you can shoot a lot of MOS and, and leave the sound people you know, back at the uh, restaurant, you go a lot faster. Um, and, and, you know, you'll get a good, a good feel for New York City in the, in the early 80s. So I'll be back and talk to you later. Hi, I'm uh, Josh Olson, I'm screenwriter, co-host with Joe Dante of the movies that made me. Oh, well, hey, I was going to bring you up. Yeah, okay, fine. Uh, the writer-director, <laughs> John Sale. Thank you. I was going to do a big introduction for you. So. Uh, uh. How are you doing? Good. Okay. Um, so I have to ask you first, John, as a, uh, uh, I mean, you're, you're a great writer, you're a novelist, you're a master of character, structure, dialogue, nuance, uh, you're an icon of independent film. Um, what was it like doing fight scenes with Steve James? Yeah, you know, <laughs> Steve James is, is uh, um, was, died very young. Uh, he was in a lot of Kung Fu movies, he was a lot of, you know, uh, kind of movies that played on 42nd Street. He had been in a play that I had written. Oh, really? And he and Tom Wright, the, the other guy who's in the, in the fight in the bar with us, uh, were both kind of stuntman actors. Uh, if you ever saw Ford Apache, the, the Bronx, yeah. they actually throw bottles at themselves in the movie because they play, <laughs> both play policemen and gang members. Oh, really? um, <laughs> And they were wonderful. They, you know, they we we worked out a very, you know, that fight in the bar at the end. Uh, we worked out, and I storyboarded it with them and everything like that. But we only had that bar until like six thirty when the bar opened again up in Harlem. 
And so we had to be out at 6.30. And, uh, That's why no broken mirrors or anything. Well, it's why we dropped about 12 shots. And so at some point, you know, with, with maybe 40 minutes to go, I said, guys, we're way in the back of the bar. How do we get to the front of the bar? And they figured out the thing with throwing the pool balls to drive those people back. Fantastic. And Tom was um, doubling for Joe and when he does that flip. And he was probably in midair doing that flip five minutes before we were out of the bar. <laughs> so it was that kind of day. Um, and and Steve, you know, he, he said, you know, you're going to get a lot of adrenaline. So try to slow yourself down a little. And David and I managed not to hurt ourselves doing yeah. it. But, well, that's good. Um, a lot of what, the men in black that we played, um, we shot, you, you kind of notice if you're really paying attention, we shot a lot of that backwards. So when we walk into the bar oh, the first wow. time, oh. we actually started on the stools, turned around, and backed out of the bar. And, and you see us walking in the street that way a couple times. And it gives a very strange movement to things. Um, I, am I just, did anybody else notice that? Yeah, it's just the, yeah, the strangeness it's, it's is really there. well done. Yeah. Um, the, the, we <laughs> at first I thought we might be able to do our dialogue backwards, oh, that's... Um, and the only thing we were able to do is when we order beer, which is reap, um, and and it sounds like beer back. But right. when I tried to do whole, it sounded like a David Lynch movie. So. Yeah, yeah, that gum you like. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I wanted to ask you too. Um, you know, I, uh, Ernest Dickerson had only done a couple of short films. When yeah, he, Ernest, did Ernest, How did you come to Ernest? Well, I wanted um, African Americans to be heads of departments. Mm -hmm. We were going to be shooting in Harlem, and, and also just at that time, there weren't enough African Americans on crews. Yeah. Spike really hadn't started yet, and and he really did a lot to br to bring people into that part of the 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 you know industry. Um, Ernest had shot uh, a movie um, in Curacao. And he told me it was in 35, because uh, he figured he'll never see a movie I shot in Curacao. <laughs> and it was actually in 16. Um, <laughs> and he had shot um, Joe's Bed-Stuy Barbershop yeah, with Spike's Cut Heads, which short, was Spike yeah. Short. Yeah. And I was just, you know, I really wanted an African American cin cinematographer, and there weren't that many choices around. And then I got Ernest, and I saw Joe's Bed's, and I said, I got, like, the best cinematographer. And I hadn't made many movies, and, and we weren't really able to work with IA guys yet or anything like that. So I just got really, really lucky. Uh, very lucky, yeah. yeah. And then um, and Joe had some credits, but had you had you worked with Joe Morton before? No, I knew, I knew Joe Morton as a, a theater actor. He had okay. a very good reputation as a Shakespearean theater actor. Um, he had been the boyfriend of an actress I had worked with once, and I had so I had, like met him at a at a you know a play, and then uh, when we had people come in to read, you know for a part, how do you read somebody for a part who's mute? So I would just meet these actors, and some of them I knew their work, and some of them I didn't, and uh, just talk to them about. How do you get into the movie business and stuff like that? And Joe told a story. His father had been a military guy, so Joe had grown up on military bases all over the world, Okinawa and and maybe Guam, I think, in Germany and stuff like that. And then his his when he was ten years old or so, his his father died, and he moved back to the states to his mother's neighborhood in Harlem, and he had a slight German accent, and kids beat him up because he was an alien. You know, and I figured, yeah, I know uh, this guy's a good actor, and uh, I think he really understands yeah, the story. Into you know? like that. The first day we worked with Joe, and you know, I, I had to say to them, we've only got four weeks to shoot. We're not shooting in sequence, and you know, this is a story about assimilation. So by the end of it, he can he can pass. He's kind of dressing like humans more. He's walking like humans more. You know, he, it, he's really still an alien, but he's he's learned to kind of not send off signals like there's something weird about this guy. And that's, an, that's a real arc. And the hardest thing in movie acting yes. is you're shooting out of sequence. And if you've got an arc from one place to the other, you're shooting scene 13, scene two, the, your dying scene, then you're meeting your wife, and then, you know, and then you're divorcing your wife the next day, and then all the scenes in between. Um, so I said, Joe, you're going to have to keep track of your arc. Yeah. You know, I, ask me questions if you need it, but I'm going to be really busy trying to make a feature in four weeks. <laughs> and he just did it brilliantly. You know, he just, he just, when I put it in order, you see him assimilate. 
Yeah, he does evolve. I was wondering about, you know, what was the sort of day-to-day -day direction because there's such a there's such a sort of openness to the character and in, in good ways and bad for you him. You know, we, we, we talked a little bit. I, I just said, I, I think this guy can, um, if he can look you in the eye, no matter what language, he can kind of understand what's going on. And so then I, I, I wrote the, 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 the scene on the subway where the guy does, tells him the card story. Yeah. And he's confused because there's no reality to it. Yeah. I mean, he can look at the guy, but he's telling him a story that, where there's no real people. And, and that came because Fisher Stevens, who's in, in the scene, um, when he came in to audition for Baby It's You, which you see next, um, the casting director said, oh, and Fisher, do that card trick for him. <laughs> and so in the script it says... He sits down on the subway, and next to him is Fisher Stevens, who does his card trick for him. Fantastic. Because you know? I didn't remember the card trick. Right. And I, I cast Fisher, and he said, yeah, I remember. I can do that. Um, we shot that. Um, it's very difficult to shoot, especially back then, I, you know, if you didn't have a gazillions of dollars in the subway in New York. Yeah. Um, and the guy who was in charge of the liaison between the subway department was, was kind of a, a, a sadist. And he would promise you you had a, a day, and then he'd say, oh, no, I'm only giving you a half day. Um, and usually it was not in the subway itself. It was in a subway museum in Brooklyn. So we would put strip up lights next to it, and you could open and close the doors and stuff. And, uh, you know, we'd kind of have people rock or whatever. And uh, so we, we, you know, he cut us down a little bit in time, and we're doing that subway season. And scene and, and Fisher does his trick and I said to the extras who are a mixed group of extras okay you know here's this phenomenon when you know um, you know when when the doors open I'm going to do the voice I'll put another voice in later and it says you know 96th street next next stop 125th street and all the white people get off and uh, got it everybody and this one Japanese American guy raised his hand and said what do I do and and I said, that's the story of your life, isn't it? And <laughs> that's well. That's lovely. Speaking of um, uh, the script, I was. I've, this is such a picky in question, but it's it's such a lovely scene when um, Joe uh, is telling the singer how much he loves her music. How did you script that? And if so, how or was it just? No, you know, Joe. Joe was such an expressive actor. I, I said, you know, one thing that he did was once I told him that you have to be looking in their eyes. There's a couple of times when people are talking to him, and the way you do, you look away, and yeah. he'll do he'll do this or he'll move to get in their eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, he also figured out because you know of of other things that happen in the movie that you know he has this outlet, and he said, I'm I'm I, I think I'm really. You know, any any high electricity, any voltage, I have to cover that up. I'm very sensitive there. You know, um, and so he he just wants to communicate so badly. One thing I did is I said, you know, go kind of. I'm not going to do many takes, and so um, you're going to get a lot of nice opportunities to be doing this the first time with this actor. And just, just like in real life, if something do doesn't speak, they don't hear or they don't speak your language, people talk a little louder and more slowly with them. And even the actors, because Joe would stay away from them and not say, what are we going to do in this scene? Yeah. Most of what you've seen in this movie is first take. Oh, wow. And so he's, he's trying to express himself, and he would leave that kind of to the last minute. He wouldn't, you know, mm. and, and, really, and, and then people are getting this guy for the first time. Yeah. That's fantastic. Um, the uh, like all of your movies, it always strikes me as as diverse and as wide ranging as they are in in, in everything, really, and even in genre. Uh, there's always this sense of the place and the people who live there, mm -hmm. um, and it just seems like you've spent an extraordinary amount of time in a lot of places to have gotten that mm -hmm. deep into it. How how much time had you spent in Harlem? Very little, actually. So, yeah, so I, I've process? been in other black neighborhoods and mm -hmm. you know went to very mixed high school and stuff like that. But um, one of the things I was very conscious of is that Harlem, just like Hollywood, is is a, a real place and it's an iconic place. Right. You know, and so it has a play, a part in people's imagination. Um, quite honestly, when we started sh shooting up there, uh, there was just stuff that, oh, that's there. We're, it's in the movie. Right. You know, here's the vibe here. I'm going to get that in the movie. Um, uh, it was 
the great thing about it is we made a movie for, I think it was $400,000. Um, the minute we said we were shooting in, in Harlem, the Teamsters chose not to even ask us whether they could be involved in the project. <laughs> um, but we could park anywhere we wanted because there was a lot of parking spaces up there. So, so many of the usual problems of shooting in New York City were not there. We had parking wherever we wanted. Um, I the, sometimes, you know, we were shooting at nights, and the police said, "Well, we have to be on the set," and we would say, "Could you be two blocks away?" Because your presence is going to cause more problems sure, yeah. with the neighborhood and the and the vibe. Because we're having a nice time here, and people are coming and watching. The the scene where. Um, uh, Joe Morton's, you know, the, the brother uh, shoots himself up with um, uh, heroin and then he, he kind of comes out and he's woozy and, and you, he, 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 we kind of do a 360 and there's this kind of big jump and then it comes back and he's moved up right into the lens. Um, we had 300 people at 2 or 3 in the morning who were just watching and being really nice about moving but a 360, there was nowhere for them to hide. Right. And so Ernest said, well, the guy's stoned, so I can just kind of do a camera movement over them. And so <laughs> there are 300 people there who you don't see in the shot. Um, but we, you know, people just kind of, what's this about? Oh, that sounds cool. Right. You know. um, well, you talked earlier about where this one came from. But I, I mean, I wonder, do you, uh, do you find yourself you know, driving through places you've never been and stories coming out of them as you go? Or you know, it's a disease. Of, you know, yeah. you see a great looking place, and, oh, that would be cool in a movie. You know, cool you're up year. in a balloon. And I say, oh, this would be a great shot from a balloon. And, you know, so that happens all the time. It's just, you know, the practical side of your brain just says, no way in hell <laughs> am I going to get to do something here or, right. you know, that movie that I just thought of just practically is not going to happen. So this one came from a dream. Mm -hmm. um, we're gonna go back in time now. One film, mm -hmm. uh, the baby, it's you. And where, where, what was the genesis of? The the genesis of that was uh, Amy Robinson had originally a, a, a company with Griffin Dunn and Mark Metcalf, other actors that they had started, basically being actors out of work. And oh, we'll produce a play and we'll be in it. And many producers have started that way. Yes. Um, and so they produced a play, and then they actually produced a movie um, uh, from an Ann Beatty uh, novel um, that, that ended up being called um, Chilly Scenes of Winter. Well, it was Chilly Scenes of Winter, and then they made it sound like a skiing movie. I forget what the eventual part. Head Over Heels, yeah. Yeah, Chilly Scenes of Winter, Head Over Heels are not the same movie, but okay. you know that's what happened to it. And uh, Mark Metcalf went off. He, he's the guy who plays Niedermeyer in Animal House. Animal, okay, and yeah. so he kind of had more of a career at the moment. And so it became from triple play, it became double play. And I had made one movie. And so they came to me and they said, well, we have this idea. Um, kind of based on stuff that happened to Amy when she was in, in Trenton High School. Uh, and she was about two a year or two older than me. And as she told me the story, I said, oh, that's what happened in the girls' locker room. Here's what happened in the boys' locker room. I'd gone to a very similar high school. Uh -huh. And so she brought me this idea of this, this kind of ro romance between this, you know, kind of hoodie guy, but very romantic hoodie guy, and this Jewish girl destined to go to Sarah Lawrence. Um, which was a romance possible in high school. Yeah. And then in the American class system, it's not going to continue. Not, not so much. Um, and I love the idea, and so I wrote the script, and various things happened, and finally we ended up making it at Paramount after it had been at another studio, and they put it into turnaround. And actually, um, a wonderful young woman named Ter Claire Townsend, who was one of the first female studio executives, uh, had been at the original studio, and when they put it into turnaround, she says, well, I want to see this movie, and she kind of became the agent for setting it up somewhere else. Um, and so, you know, it kind of evolved between, you know, what I kind of knew and felt about the period and what Amy knew and felt about the period with this, this seed of this romance between these two kids. Um, which seems like a good place to, uh, should we bring on the chic? Yeah. <laughs> Vincent. Ladies and gentlemen, Vincent Spano, the chic. And if you and if you uh, stay with this series, um, uh, Vincent's also got a kind of the yes. lead part in um, City of Hope. Yeah, that's Monday night. Yeah. Yes. 
another great film. Uh, so how did you guys come together? Was it just casting, casting or, yeah? And <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, uh, um, wonderful uh, Margie Simkin, who was our, our casting director, just threw everybody, you know. And I, you know, after the first day of casting, I said, you know, those people were all too old. And she said, oh, you really want them? Yeah. I mean, I'd already said, I want them to be close to the age of right. the high school kids. And there were, you know, people were, 28 years old and stuff like that, you know. And she said, you really want them to be that. And so she, you know, a new group of actors. And we saw everybody. We saw Sean Penn. We saw, you know, Tom Cruise. We saw some really good actors. Mm -hmm. And I kept just saying, well, he's not Italian, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, and some of them were Italian. And they just, you know. And, and, and then Vinny came in. And uh, I had seen you in Over the Edge. Right. I yes. think that was the only thing I, I'd seen you in at that point. And I just said, well, that's the guy. You know, all oh, right. And the same thing with Rosanna. We got down to like five, five actresses. And we actually did screen tests with them. And Rosanna had only been in one or two things as well. And then the studio had some idea about a couple other. One guy who was like British or something like that. Not a bad actor, but he's British. You know, right, come on. Right. Um, and uh, they kind of at the last, like a week before we were going to shoot, they said, well, we're not so sure about this with that cast. And they said, well, that's the cast. And and we kind of stonewalled. And they said, okay, go ahead, do it. <laughs> um, it was only $3 million. And we kind of did it in a kind of buyback program. And uh, and it was a great shooting experience. And then it was kind of a nightmare during the editing. Oh, wow, why is that? Well, because well, they wanted it to turn into um, Porky's or, uh, you know, like a teenage comedy, which it was never meant to be. Well, at the time that John was casting the film, I was actually off in Morocco shooting the Black Stein Returns mm -hmm. in the middle, basically in the middle of the Sahara Desert, you know. And, you know, this was uh, 81, 82, maybe early 82. So, you know, you couldn't just do self-tapes back then, you know. Yeah. There was no such thing. I mean, you barely had cameras. Um, it, I mean, the, I think there was one RCA, you know, portable VHS, which is a big, huge thing with a camera and a big mm -hmm. wire. In it. So the way I held John's interest, I don't know if you remember this, mm -hmm. I, I asked the actress, um, Jody Thielen, if she would just read the scene with me. And I took like a cassette, like I had a Genesis cassette or something there in Africa, and I had a recording, you know, a recording thing. And, mm -hmm. and we put it in there, and, and I read the scene. And my manager was visiting with Matt Dillon. Mm -hmm. And it was just timing. We were like a little family back then. And... I also did a screen test for the outsiders, and the way I did that was I got them to give me, uh, you know, some short ends and the sound, loan me some, you know, some extra tape for the Nagra, and we did a little screen test right before lunch. So there I was, like this Arabian prince, and I threw everything off and put on this, you know, Pony Boy's older brother uh, costume. Yeah. And we shot that. So again, my manager was visiting. So what he did when he came back to New York, he went back to New York with Matt, and they brought the negative and the sound. And this little cassette tape. Mm -hmm. Because I was like, please, I love this script. I love this. I got to play this part. Mm -hmm. I got to be in this movie. Please get them to wait for me to come back. Uh -huh. And that's what did the trick. Because John was able to go over and look at... We, we, the sound was never sunk up, but he got to see me, like, what I look like right now in, uh, over at Barry Malkin's, I think, yeah, um, yeah. editing place, and, uh, and listen to the cassette. And literally, I'd been away for six months, and the day after I got back... I was in the office reading for John and uh, and Amy and I think um, and Marjorie, of course. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. It was it was actually fun. You know, of course, if you you cast a high school movie, 10, 15 years later, some of those people are going to be real names and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but it was you know, it was kind of fun to read for it, and we ended up with some kids who were younger than the part that they were playing. Mm. Um, you'll see Robert Downey in, in this. I think it was the first movie he made that his because he, he was in small parts in his dad's kind of experimental movies. And uh, we did cut his biggest scene out, so I think he, he know, knew it as Maybe It's You for a long time. Uh, maybe It's You. Matthew Modine, this was his first movie. Um, and, uh, and really some, some of the actors in it who do wonderful work who never really acted that much you know, before, and kind of, you know, which happens to actors as well, yeah. drop by the wayside.
Bracy Pollen was in it. Yeah. Um, did you did you test the two of them together at any point, or was that? Uh... I don't think we did. I, I I think I remember testing you with our friend Marisa, who's not even in the movie. Who was like ten years too old. Well, I, I think I just read for you, and then you did the screen test. Yeah. For me to to see my chemistry with the girls. Right. Right. Okay. And so I did test with multiple girls, but not that many. But uh, and then Rosanna came in. Yeah. And everybody knew. It was like, okay, yeah, yeah. that's it. Okay, so that's you did that, yeah, because I was yeah. wondering about because there's such a such a palpable chemistry yeah. between them. That's, mm -hmm. uh, um, well, how how was that? Was that probably, you were talking before about you know obviously I mean all movies shot out of sequence, but this one mm -hmm. particularly goes through all these various time frames. Did you try to stay in any kind of we, sense? We of we tried to do the high school stuff first and the college stuff second. You know, mm -hmm. a little bit, and because of locations, we could kind of do that. Yeah, uh, we didn't get to shoot you know totally in in sequence. But I think the you know some of the meeting stuff between them we got to do first, and then the, the you know we they kind of stayed away from each other before the first big makeout scene and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, but yeah, you, you don't get. I had Michael Bauhaus who had had shot one movie in the states that never got a release, and but I knew his stuff from from Fassbender's movies. Okay. And Michael was his English was pretty good then. He was a wonderful guy. His two sons were working on his camera crew, um, and he also was was like the best operator I've ever worked with. So he, in those days, you know, when the, we, it was a Nabet movie, not a IA movie, you could operate. And and just like the first day, I said, "Oh my God! First of all, this guy's a great operator, and second of all, we are so on the same page. When I say low and wide, this is before video assist, mm -hmm. and I look through the camera. That's my low and wide." Because very often you're low and wide, and, and the DPs low and wide are, are very very different. You, and you, you thought you had everything set up, and you got to move it over and stuff like that. And it was like, geez, we're, you know, we're, we're you know, and just a great. And the other thing was that um, Michael, his parents had been actors, so he'd been around actors quite a bit. And and so even though he didn't always understand the English, he had such a dramatic sense of the heat of a scene. So when we have some of the big dramatic scenes between, you know, uh, Vincent's character and Rosanna's character, I would say, okay, just build me a big cage so they can move around. Uh, he would be whispering in German with his this guy Hans Booker, his focus puller, who never made a mark on the lens or the floor. Just one of those guys who could do it. Never made a measurement. Didn't Never even carry a, 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 a ruler. And, and <laughs> Michael would calling. whisper in German, I'm going with the girl, I'm going with the girl, or, or, or Vincent, 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 Vincent. You know, and, he, and the focus would change as they move around each other. So it kept a spontaneity between yeah. them. I didn't have to, you're, you're having a screaming fight breaking up with, with this you know, person you loved, and I'm going to make you hit a mark. It was just like, guys, you know, just get into each other and go where you go, and Michael could follow it um, with this great, you know. Hans spoke almost no English, uh, except for great, uh, no, um, Mothers of Invention lyrics. <laughs> so, you know, at lunch he would come up to me and, and start, what is the ugliest part of your body? Some say a nose, some say a toast. I think it's your mind. <laughs> I talked to the director. Yeah. Um, so, which, yeah, so you, um, Fisher Stevens notwithstanding, I would imagine, and I'm just guessing that your scripts are, you're fairly tight with script, though. Yeah, yeah there's not um, a whole lot of improving. Yeah, I mean, how, Vincent, what's it like when you're, where you're sort of, you know, as an actor, I know you get a lot of, like, you get a lot of scripts, a lot of them kind of lay there, uh, you have to sort of bring them to life. What's it like when you're reading, like, John Sayles' dialogue and knowing, I'm going to get to do this? <sighs> well, that's the amazing thing about John's films. They... They it, people ask a lot. Was the film improvised? And I said, No. That's how good John writes. That's how good he can hear people. How would they sound like? What they what the, how? And and as John will tell you, like when he writes a character, like the movies about that character, even if it's for one scene or a few lines. So it's he economically gets out what needs to be created in that moment to establish that that character who they are. And, and so when you read a script like that. It just speaks to you, and you're like, I, I just have to show up and say these words, and of course, do it as you know, naturally as. And the combination of those two ends up with people going, "Oh man, how much of that was improvised?" Yeah, and it was. It was all on the page. Well, it's got to be flat. All of it. 
Yeah, I let Joe Morton improvise in Brother from Another Planet. Yeah, well, no, yeah. truly, truly, a lot of times I just said, "Here's the situation, Joe." Right. He couldn't blow a line because he didn't have any lines, but there was a certain amount of leeway. He has more leeway than any other actor I've, I've ever worked with. Um, <laughs> Uh, so as a uh, Philly boy and diehard Springsteen fan, I got to ask, um, how, how'd that happen? Um, yeah, that that was kind of a, a, a complicated thing. Um, uh, let's see. Um, I had uh, first of all, what we when we contacted you know Bruce and his people, we said, well, here's the deal. Um, we're going to use your songs, and you get to see the cut. And if you hate it, we'll take them out. We've got alternates and stuff like that. Um, so, so we had kind of, you know, through his, his through, um, uh, I think I got the contact through Dave Marsh, who's written about him, who was a, a friend of, of, of Maggie's brother in law. And, you know, and then uh, John, John uh, uh, Landau, who, who runs his operations, said, yeah, I was kind of interested in that. And, you know, and then they liked the film. Clearly. And they not only let us use the music, but they said, well, you know, we own, we own the performance and CBS or whoever owns the publishing. Um, or no, we own the publishing. They own the performance. We'll give it to you for like a dollar a song. Exactly. So we paid half price for Bruce Springsteen's songs because yeah. they, you know, that was really, really generous. And, you know, all the rest of the stuff is period stuff. Yeah. And I just felt like, though, he, he just, this was his world. Yeah. And so you don't hear it coming out of jukebox, but we got to use these four songs. And it, you know, and I got to cut to them, which was just a thrill to cut to Bruce, you know. Uh, Adam raised a cane and stuff like that. And I knew those songs, yeah. and I knew they would energize the scenes. And I was a huge Springsteen fan as a young man. Yeah. I mean, I knew about him very early because my mother's friend Chris was a uh, journalist for the Rolling Stone, and she would mm. get these demo demo uh -huh, versions yeah. of these albums early, and I was I was just so crazy about Bruce. And then we did the movie, and and then was, I was 19 years old. I was, and because of the film, I sort of got an in at his office, and they'd get me tickets. And one of the performances I went to in out at the Meadowlands, they said, uh, you know, we want you to go into this room after the show, and. And then Bruce was there. He came out. He says, "Yeah, man, how you doing?" He's like, uh, "I really like the movie, man. I really like the movie." Yeah. I said, "You did? You did?" He said, <laughs> "He said, yeah." I said, "Did you did you see it in the theater?" He says, "Oh yeah, I went to the theater. Yeah, what, what, what like during the day or night?" No, nah, I went during the day. I was kind of alone. I just put my legs up and I watched the movie. And I thought it was really great, man. I really liked it. <laughs> so my, I was good, man. I yeah. was good. <laughs> Uh, yeah. It's the only movie that I didn't have a composer. Uh, a guy uh, named Joel Sill, um, who was a kind of record producer in New York, he he did all the clearances. That soundtrack today would cost you more than, oh, than sure. five movies. Well, that, you um, couldn't get it on video forever. But right? um, there were there used to be a lot of little publishing companies, and you could kind of yeah. deal with them. And then they all consolidated into like three who who cut no breaks for anybody. So. Uh, um, when the movie came out, finally, when Paramount kind of, you know, paid off some things they were supposed to pay off, and it finally came out on DVD, we had to change a few songs. Yeah. But none of the Bruce songs we, we had to change. Um, we have time for just a couple questions from the audience, I think. If um, anybody has a question, we've got a microphone there. There you go. The... Yeah. Um, I was oh, we're getting you a mic. Don't worry. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, uh, this is one of my favorite teenage romances of all time, oh, so thanks for making it. Thanks. Um, I wanted to know how you guys kind of won the fight with Paramount about trying to make it more of a Porky's or kind of like raunchy teen comedy, which it's so not. You know, they read the script and they, they gave us the money to make it, and then during the editing or something, uh, Porky's and um, Fast Times at Ridgemont High came out. And they just decided it should be more of a high school comedy, um, and we, you know, we 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 showed a cut, and they did a test marketing thing, and it tested like sixty six, you know, which is low for them, and was pretty good for me. Um, and then uh, basically they kicked me out of the editing room, um, uh, had a new editor come in, they. Um, brought me to the screening of the new one and another test screening and I thought it was just incoherent. I didn't like it at all. 
was and it funny? I just said, you know, I'm not going to put my name on this. Guys, it's your movie, but, you know, I'm not going to put my name on this. And it tested one point lower than mine had tested. <laughs> so they just, I pre- think they pretty much just said, okay, we don't want the bad publicity, this guy taking his name off it and making a big fuss. So we'll just let him finish it, and then we'll basically sit on it. So so they, they let us make the movie, and, and it's pretty much the cut that I wanted to. Um, and then... You know, there, there's a book called Produced and Abandoned, and Baby It's You is, is one of the movies in the, you know, they, they kind of half distributed it. Uh, we talked to people in the distribution arm who said we were told we would be fired if we were caught working on this film and trying to get publicity for it. So so it had a very small, very quick release. So it was, it was kind of a standoff, um, but you know, the movie holds up and, and uh, you know, they didn't make any money on it. Um, and they also told Griffin Dunn, one of the producers, oh, we'll take care of, when, when you, you cleared rights for music, there were theatrical rights and then synchronization rights, which, which covered things like home video. And they, they just lied to him. They said, oh, we covered those. And then they said, oh, actually, we didn't cover those. And so it, it was not available for another seven or eight years until the regime changed at Paramount. And uh, the guy in the video department who'd always wanted to put it out was able to you know, finally get them to pay off those few, you know, those those kind of fees to the publishers. Uh, one more question before we're... Gentlemen here right in the middle. <clears throat> John, back in the day, before I ate, everything was melded together in the tape in New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, NABIT was a union that had um, come into existence because in IA, you know, up to about that point, um, if, if you started as a camera assistant, it was going to take you 50 years to get to be an operator. They just, they had a lot of operators and they didn't want the competition or whatever. So a bunch of young guys who were really ready to shoot formed this union NABIT. And, and they had some really good, you know, crew people in it. Um, because Paramount did it, did the movie as a negative pickup, which meant that they they gave us a slip of paper that we took to a bank who loaned us three million dollars to make the movie, and then Paramount it wasn't officially a Paramount movie, so it didn't have to be an IA movie. And uh, Amy had heard about this guy, you know, uh, Michael Bauhaus, who had shot this. Actually, uh, he had shot this movie called Mr. Wonderful, which starred Joe Pesci before he was well known. Very good movie. Uh, made by Peter Lilienthal, an uh, uh, um, Argentinian filmmaker, but never got it picked up. And so she, I think we can, you know, make this cheaper with with Nabe, but with really good DP. She had all these Fassbender movies, um, and and once again we were in heart, you know, we we were in New Jersey. We shot in Hoboken. I think we shot one shot in New York City. Um, we went out to, you know, Uppsala College and shot a couple days there or something like that. And, and truly the only problems we had were, were, were with the Teamsters. Um, we, we had a meeting, our, our production manager had a meeting with Vinnie Lutze, who was the New Jersey Teamster guy, who proudly said, I'm the most indicted Teamster <laughs> captain in America, you know. <laughs> So we had to hire these Jersey guys, and then the New York Teamster said, you know, they don't have jurisdiction over Jersey. They're just a bunch of assholes. We have jurisdiction. So we had extra Teamsters on it, and the New York Teamsters, who were real professionals, said, we're not getting any vehicle with one of those Jersey assholes driving it. So we were carrying the Jersey guys. Um, And so that made things a little complicated. But basically, the rest of the crew were great. You know, and Michael was a wonderful, you know, leader of troops. So I had a I had a ball shooting. It was more money than I'd ever had. I I hadn't made anything over a million dollars at that point. And Michael was not only good, he was fast and he was nice with the actors and the actors, you know, liked working with him. So it was kind of a dream job for me. Uh, well, I guess we're, yeah, that's all the time we've got. So, John, uh, Vincent, thank you guys so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks coming for coming here. Everybody. Thanks for making this. Um, hope you'll stick around. We're going to take a brief break and then come back for Baby It's You. Enjoy it.